But occasionally I'll break it up into a mini series of sorts. And that's what I'm doing for the last couple of weeks and will this week and next. And today I want to talk about why you can believe in both heaven and hell. And we're going to go through it. And of course, I'm going to give you the bad news first. We're going to get the bad news first. And I want you to imagine this scenario. Now, this is actually a true story. So I want you to um, meet this professor. I don't know his name, but this professor at the start of his term... He wanted to make it very clear because he understood that these kids coming in, they're coming out of high school. How many of you know that high school is a joke and you didn't know that until you got to college and found out you didn't know nothing, okay? And you get into college, and I remember college because I got in there and the first week I had 600 pages worth of reading in textbooks and that I had to buy, which was an amazing concept. I mean, so college is completely different. And this professor, he knew that. He, he explained to his students, listen, I, I know where you're coming from. I know your attitude. I know your background. So I'm going to be very, very clear. Your whole grade in this class, it's not based on homework because I don't check it. It's not based on your mommy and daddy. It's based on three term papers. That's it, kid. Three term papers. And they got to be done my way. And he gives them the list. And he says the number one rule is that you absolutely cannot be late unless you are dead. That's the only excuse, death. So you must be on time. If you're not on time, it's an automatic F. Let's be clear about that. It's in writing. Everybody understands this. So the first term paper comes due. There were 250 people in his classroom, and there were 25 really unhappy people. Because 225 turned in their papers. And these other 25, where's your paper? And they are giving them all kinds of reasons and excuses and this and that. And he just comes after them. Did you understand clearly what I was saying? You know that you deserve an F. Yes, we understand. But they're pleading for something. And finally, the professor says, yeah, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you mercy this time. Turn it in tomorrow. And, of course, they rush around to get it done and get it turned in. Well, the second paper comes around, and word had gotten out. Because now 200 people turn in their papers, and there's 50 that are a little worried. And he gives them the same speech. Do you understand clearly? And everybody's listening that if the paper is late, you get an F. Yes, they understood that. And they asked him for the same thing. Would you, would you give us a second chance? Would you help us out? And finally, the professor says, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you mercy this time. I can do that. Turn it in tomorrow. So they do. So lo and behold, the third paper comes due. And 150 people turn it in on time. And there's 100 people out there, and they're not too worried at all. In fact, they anticipate the same thing. Mercy, right? And so they are absolutely outraged when he puts a great, big, huge F on the top of every single one of those papers. And people are upset. They are outraged. In fact, in the next class, when they come back, he just can't even get them settled. They're so upset. A hundred people are all upset. Finally, he gets everybody calmed down, and he says, the same thing. Did you understand clearly what the rules were? And they go, no, no, no. You don't understand. We want justice. You let us off the first time and the second time. And the professor goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You want justice? All right. Justice is I go back and I change the first paper and the second paper to F's as well. That's justice. And then everybody's quiet. He said, I laid it out clearly. Here's the standards. Here's the rules. If you don't follow through, you get an F. Justice is you get an F. Mercy is totally my prerogative. Totally mine. It has nothing to do with you. You see, there's a huge difference between justice and mercy. Big difference. And most people in our culture have absolutely no idea what the difference is. 
You see, because our entire culture is wrapped around the idea of merit, earning something. The society and the culture around us owes me something just because I am a human being. I live in this culture, therefore the culture should give me whatever I need, medical and food and this and that. We are used to that. We feel that that is what is just, is just because I'm human, I should get whatever it is I need, whether I worked for it or not. That is the idea. We believe in, in a merit system of some kind. But you see, the attitude of this last group is very telling. They're demanding of justice, not realizing what they're demanding. That's typical of people in our culture, people today. You see, they figured that a good professor would just let them off of the standard. That's what a good person would do, right? But you see, they forget something. A good person will always uphold the rules, the law. That's what a good person would do, right? A good person will always uphold the rules, always uphold the law. So the truth is, a good professor would never let them off. Who would always give them an F? You're late. That's the rules. That's, that's it. Always going to do the right thing. You see, that's what justice is. Justice is following through on the law, on the rules. That's it. There's no equivocation of any kind. That's what justice is. And in this case, justice would be the F on the paper. And it's the same thing with God. There are so many people that think that since God is good, he's just going to ignore the things in my life that he doesn't like. He's going to let me off because he's good. Not understanding that because God is good, he would never let you off. If he's truly good, if he just lets you off, then he's not good, is he? No. He's capricious. And that's not good. Be careful when you ask for a good God. Because good means he's always going to follow through. You see, we forget something. Mercy is 100% undeserved. It can never be earned or it wouldn't be mercy. It would be payment. You see, if you earned it, it would be a payment. Justice is payment. Mercy is undeserved. Do you see this? We need to understand this because we live in a culture that really honestly believes more than 80% of people polled believe they're going to heaven because they are good people. They earned it. My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, therefore I get to go to heaven. A good God would do that for me. They don't understand God and they don't understand good. And we need to clear this up that mercy is 100% undeserved. See, many of these students in this class were nice students. They got an F. Many of them were good people. They still got an F. Many of these people had a very hard life, and it, it was really hard to get into college, and, and they had all kinds of things going against them. You'd think they deserve an F. Many of them did good things for other people, and they were a part of clubs, and they were raising money for for the Palestinians and everything else. And guess what? They still got an F. It doesn't matter how nice you are, how cute you are, how hard your life has been, how many good things you've done, how many excuses that you have. It doesn't matter. No one deserves mercy ever. You can't deserve something that you can't earn. Mercy is 100% the professor's prerogative. It's based on his compassion. It's based on his love. Does that make sense? See, when people ask me questions about heaven and about hell, it usually betrays this thinking that we have in our culture. Most people think that they're going to heaven. If you ask them, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm a good person. Well, what about hell? Well, I don't believe in hell. You mean, what about Hitler? Well, how about, uh, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, the guy that killed Nate people? What about him? Well, 
Maybe there's a hell for really bad people. But not me. I'm not an axe murderer. Right? So I'm a good person. I get to go there. Where do you draw these lines? People are making up their own standards about how they're going to get to heaven. But what they don't understand is that like the college class, they're not the teacher. They don't get to set the rules. No one does. Except the teacher. Right? And it is God, this life that you live, God is the one that initiated it in the beginning. He is the one that created Adam and Eve. You exist today, not by your own will. You didn't ask to be born. You exist today because he allowed it. You owe your existence to him. And just like the college class, life is God's class. And his standards he has set. And they are very, very clear. And God has exactly zero obligation to give mercy to anyone. And the truth of the matter is, just like the college class, it doesn't matter if those college kids were nice or cute or had a hard life or lots of excuses or did a lot of good things. They still deserve to know. If God was only just, then no one could be saved. No one. Because everybody's laid on their term paper. It's very simple. You're writing your term paper right now. I'm currently on chapter 47. I'm almost done. Chapter 48 begins August 1st. I do take uh, birthday gifts, no problem. Just thought I'd mention it. But I'm writing my term paper right now. And God has made it very clear how I'm supposed to write my paper. I should not write things in there that offend him. But I have. I have written lust in there when God said you shall not. I have written covetousness in there when God said you shall not. I have written theft in my story. I have written lies. I have written self-centeredness, pride. I have written these things. And he told me not to write those things. So what grade am I going to get? Got to get an F. Simple as that. You see, justice for me would be an F. Would be for you too. Because it's God who set those standards. And if we come up short on the standards, then we're going to get an F. And what does an F mean for us today? It basically means this. If I don't relate to God on his terms, then I'm going to be cut off from him. That's what an F means. I'm going to be cut off from him. Now, what does that mean? Let's think about it for a second because there's plenty of misconceptions about this. I have seen the cartoons. I have seen the bumper stickers where people would say, I would rather go to hell because that's where my friends are. I'd rather go to hell because that's where all the fun is. After all, we all know that Christians are the party poopers. So I would rather go to the place where people are having a good time. I've seen this many, many times. But what people do not understand is that God is the creator of life. God is the creator of the universe. So to be cut off from him is to be cut off from all that he is. Now let's think about this for a second. God is love. God is light. God is peace. God is rest. And God is joy. Yes, that's who he is. So if you're cut off from those things... There may be your friends in hell, but you will have no relationship with them because it is God that creates fellowship, and without him there is no fellowship. There is no friendship because God is the friend, right? There is no rest because God is rest. There is no light there because God is light. There is no joy there because God is joy. So to be cut off from him is to be in a place where there is no love, no light, no peace, no rest, no joy, no fellowship, forever it is a place of such regret that you will literally feed upon yourself because that's all that there is forever like a worm that gnaws and never ever ever stops i said i'd give you the bad news first because jesus spent a lot of time talking about what hell is 
And he said, you don't want to go there. You don't want to play games with this. You don't want fancy bumper stickers on this one. No more cartoons on this one. This is bad. You don't want to go there. Hell's a real place. And I didn't make it for you. I didn't make it for you. I made it for the devil and his angels. You were designed to relate to me. You were designed to be where I am. And if you reject that, it's, it's staggering how awful it will be there. But you don't have to go there. You do not have to go there. In fact, God wants you to go where he is. Look what he said. You can enter into God's kingdom, but only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and his gate is wide for the many who choose that way. Going to hell is easy. It really is. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. And as the heat gets turned up in our culture and it becomes closer and closer to the days when our master will return for us, say amen. He's coming back for us. Amen. Between now and then, the pressure is going to go up. The way is narrow and it's difficult. I didn't say that, Jesus did. It's simply the truth. You know, it's really popular today to somehow believe that all roads lead to God in the end, so quit worrying about it so much. You Christians are a bunch of arrogant toads because you say that this way is narrow and that only Jesus, I didn't say that, he did. Okay? And, and people get so upset about it. And because it's so popular to believe that all of the roads, they all converge eventually to get to the top of the hill, right? I mean, after all, I mean, most of the major religions out there, they all have similar ideas on what is good and what is bad. And, and see, that's all wrapped up in that merit mindset, isn't it? If you do enough good, well, then it'll, you'll be okay. So it doesn't really matter what road you are on. How many of you have seen this stuff? I mean, it's all around you. It's very popular. The problem is, Jesus didn't teach that. Jesus said that not all roads will lead to heaven. In fact, there's only one road. But you see, the world tries to twist it into saying that everything doesn't really matter. It all comes into the center eventually like, like spokes on a wheel. But you know what? The problem, now, now listen, I reject that teaching 100% because Jesus didn't teach it. However, let us say, for the sake of argument, that I did accept it. Let's see how it does not work. If all roads lead to heaven, that means that if you are a Satanist, you're going to get to heaven. Because all roads lead there, right? I mean, after all, if you're an atheist, it doesn't matter. You're going to get to heaven because all roads lead there. How about those cults that are out there that, uh, you know, do human sacrifice? Well, that's okay. All roads lead to heaven, right? You see how absurd that teaching is? Because that means that if, if everybody's going to get to heaven in the end, well, then there's no such thing as real truth. But as soon as you say there's no such thing as real truth, I have to ask, well, is that true? And round and round and round we go. And that is why that teaching doesn't follow. It's not logically sound. And it's not what the Bible teaches. See, so many people try to put stuff up on Facebook about what the Bible says, and they've never read the Bible. Okay? And they try to make the Bible say things that it does not say because they want to believe that whatever they do is okay, and eventually God will just be good and let them off anyway, just like that good professor, right? That's what most people want but the bible does not teach this the bible teaches something completely different and this is a teaching that you're not going to find in a lot of christian churches unfortunately because the the culture wants to say constantly 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 you're good you're okay god loves you everything's fine you're wonderful positive 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 did jesus teach this please say no because he did not you know what jesus taught there's a hell. People are going there, most of you. 
And it wasn't popular when Jesus preached it either, by the way. Because people get upset at me and they say, well, you're, you know, you know you're, you're preaching something that's not very popular. I'm just preaching what my master preached. Oh, there were crowds that followed him, but they liked the free lunches and the healings. But as soon as Jesus said, boy, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me, they all split. They don't want anything to do with that. The way is narrow. Few there are to find it, and I'm the way. Whoa, no, that's too much for me, Jesus. And they split. Wasn't popular then, not popular now. It's just the truth. Here's what the Bible really teaches. It says that human beings, no matter how good they are, no matter how nice they are, no matter what their excuses are, they're like unclean things. In fact, all of our righteousness, all the good stuff that you do, in God's view, it's like filthy rags. And unfortunately, that word in Hebrew means used menstrual cloths. That's filthy rags. Okay, give you the picture. Bad news. Your very best in God's eyes looks like that. That's what God's holiness is like. That's what the Bible teaches. It says that every single one of us has written the wrong things in our term paper. And every single one of us is getting an F no matter how nice you are. That's the bottom line. If it wasn't for the fact that God was also loving, no one would be saved. Not even Moses. He was a murderer. Remember that? How about David? Murder, adultery. The very best among us. Every single one. There are none that are righteous. No, not even one. That's the truth. And we all know it by our own experience, don't we? All of us have lived long enough to see that the human beings around us, and we ourselves, if we're honest, we are all really good at clawing and tearing at one another, trying to get what I want, what I need, out of everybody around me. And we tear each other to bloody shreds, trying to get our needs and our wants met. From everyone around us in a self-centered, self-indulgent way. And the Bible calls that tendency sin. And God hates it. God hates what sin has done to you. He's hated, he hates what it's doing in your family. He hates what that self-centered clawing has done in this city. He hates what it's done in the world. He hates what it's done throughout history. And when people <coughs> jump up and down and say, why doesn't this good God stop all this evil? The answer is, if God was only just, he would have the day that Adam took a bite. And there would be none of us here. But God is not only just. And that's important because, listen, when people ask me that question, why doesn't God? The answer is, God will. The Bible is very clear. The day is going to come where he is going to say, enough. And the gavel will fall, and the books will be opened, and there will be no more secrets. Justice will come. But fortunately, God is not only just, he is also merciful, loving, compassionate. Those things are true. And we need to focus in on some of that as well as the justice because it is true that some of us can get so focused in on what is so wrong in the world because there's so much wrong to see. It's all around us. And I get frustrated with the preachers that only preach one side of who God is. Which is God is love, God is love, God is love, God is love. Come as you are, come as you are, come as you are. God's not asking you to change anything, just show up. That's not true. And I get frustrated with that because it waters down his justice. But on the other hand, if we get so legalistic that everybody's bad, everybody's bad, everybody's bad, everybody's bad, we forget the cross. We forget that the cross was there not for justice, but for mercy. 
God poured out his wrath and his hatred for sin on himself, on his own son, on the cross. This is incredibly important because Jesus said he did this because of love. For God so loved. Without that love, there is only justice and none of us could be saved. But I think there's something in this verse that people miss. It says, for whoever believes in him. There's something else here. That word believe in Greek is pisteuo. It means to cling to. To cling to him. It can't just be, yeah, well, I believe Jesus died. and you know, whatever. Well, the devil does too. He was a witness. He was there. Okay. But he doesn't cling to Jesus for his salvation. Do you see the difference? Believes in him should not perish. So while it is true that God will not force a relationship on anyone... That is the reason there is evil in the world. It's because God will not force himself upon you. He will delay his justice as long as possible so that everyone can have an opportunity to believe in him and change and turn from it. He will give every opportunity that professor gave the first term paper, then the second term paper. It wasn't until the third paper that he dropped the hammer. And that hammer may not drop for you until you're 85. It may drop tomorrow morning. But God will delay his justice as long as he can to give you any and every opportunity to turn to him because of his overwhelming love. Now, here's the big question. What in the world is he going to give us when we turn to him? Because think about it for a second. There's two ways we could look at this. If I turn to God, God can go, well, it's about time. God could be angry, couldn't he? He'd have every right to be. But that's not who God is. God says, you know what? If you turn to me, I'm going to so completely wipe your sins out, it'll be as if your whole life looks like fresh fallen snow. And I will have no memory of anything you've ever done that offended me. Not even one memory. I will take your sins and throw them into a sea of forgetfulness that as far as the east is from the west, that's what I'll do with your sins. And you see, I think one of the things that we miss as Christians is the hope of where we're going. Here's what happens. We get so focused, so worried about this bill and that bill, and the new tires that I don't have and I need, and this and that and this, and the emotional over here, we get so wrapped up, we get so burdened, we forget where we're going. And when we forget where we're going, we lose hope, we lose steam, we lose joy, we become ineffective, and the devil wins. The devil is going to win if you allow that kind of attitude. So here's what Jesus said. He said, look, would you quit letting your heart be so troubled with all of the nonsense that's going on around you? Let not your heart be troubled. Look, you believe in God, then believe also in me. Because I'm here to tell you that in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, then I will come again and I will receive you into myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That's his promise. But you know what? We miss that. We miss that. What is the reward and why should we think about it? Why should we care? Because God says, I want to give you a hope. If all we have is hope for this life, then we should be pitied above all other peoples. Because that's no hope at all. That's no hope at all. No, God has given us a hope that transcends this life. Heaven is a special place. And if you are a Christian this morning, you're going there. 
and you need to focus on it. You need to meditate on it. You need to know about it because it needs to drive you. It needs to give you some joy. So let's talk about it. The first thing I can see about heaven is that heaven is a purposeful place. It's a prepared place. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, it says here that there are many mansions in this place. Now, the word mansions here is monē in Greek. And monē means a place that is a dwelling or abiding place, but it's a little bit deeper in Greek than it is in English. This means, the word to abide, means a place of total completeness, a place of total validation and rest for your soul. A place of ultimate comfort. That's what God is going to prepare for you. That's what he's going to prepare for you. That's what he wants you to know about. We're talking about the ultimate vacation spot. Nothing gets better. This is the vacation you go on and you just go, heck with it, I ain't going back. I'm staying here. Heaven is the place that you have longed for all your life and never even knew what you were longing for. But God says, I've gone to prepare a place for you, and I put the hope of it right into your heart. Now, let's talk a little bit about heaven and get our heads wrapped around what God has for you. Let's turn to Revelation 21. It says, Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When you get there, you will look at one another and wonder if you ever really lived. Is that just a dream back there somewhere? Because in heaven, there is no pain. There is no fear. There are no mistakes. There is no criticism. There's no one to point a finger at you ever again. You are in a place of ultimate comfort. There is no crying. There is no sorrow. And what does it look like? Verse 18 talks about the city, the great city, the ultimate, the new Jerusalem. It says that the construction of its walls was of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. Jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, emerald, sardonyx, sardius, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, jacinth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the city and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. God gave John a vision to see what heaven was like, but he's not the only one. Isaiah had a similar vision, so did Ezekiel. And the truth of the matter is, is that when we read these accounts, I have met people that I believe are credible because they know Jesus, whose hearts stopped and were dead for a certain amount of time and returned to us and told me what they saw. And it matches this. They said the first thing they realized was that they had never seen colors like these colors. I mean, when we look at this, we don't even know what a Chalcedony or a Sardonyx is. I mean, he just wrote it down. It's like, I don't know what it is, but it's cool, so I'm going to write down. I don't know. I mean, these are colors beyond your wildest imaginations. They said they can't even describe it. My grandfather told me the vision he had of heaven, and he, he started to cry, just telling me the, the colors. He couldn't tell me. Words stopped because the color was so rich, so beautiful, beyond our wildest imaginations. Now, let's think about this for just a second. Try to imagine the God who made this. You live in a world that is cursed because of sin. You live in a world that decays and dies and yet in the middle of all of that curse, God made this. If God makes this in the middle of all of this curse, 
then what is heaven where there is no curse going to be like? It is God that made these mountains. That take your breath away. Melissa and I were up there at at these mountains just last year. And in person you're going, whoa. I mean, it's just. Oh, it just blows your doors off. They're just so huge. They make you feel like this, and you can hardly breathe. It's so beautiful. And yet, those mountains were made by the flood of Noah. They're sedimentary rock, pushed up because of a curse. And yet, it's this beautiful. How about the stars? You see, death and decay were not God's idea, but even in the middle of all of that, I mean, who could have imagined that something that is dying could look like this? Those leaves are dying. And God made them beautiful even in death. And we take dead wood and make beautiful things out of it. If God can do that on a cursed earth, God on a cursed earth made the sky look like this. It is God that made the mountains, streams in the, to reflect the sky. It is God who thought to himself long ago, I'm going to make things so beautiful even on a cursed earth. I know they're not going to get the brains up to figure out how to invent a scuba tank until 50 years ago, and then they're going to see this. God is not boring even at the bottom of the sea. That's who you work for. And if God did all of this in six days, and he has now been gone for 1,982 years since he stepped out of this planet, at least physically, the Spirit is with us, right? Right here in our hearts. And it says, I've gone to prepare a place that's going to make this look black and white when I'm done with it. I mean, if the wrong side of heaven looks like this, well, what's the right side going to look like? Do you see what I'm saying? That's the hope that you have. People don't understand heaven. They think heaven's going to be boring. That's because they don't understand that God is not boring. I mean, seriously, I saw this far side cartoon where you see this guy in heaven sitting on a cloud with a harp, and he's all by himself, and he says at the bottom, boy, I wish I brought a magazine. You see, that's what people think. People think that heaven is one long, boring church service. And they have a hard time staying awake for an hour as it is, and they're thinking to themselves, I don't want to go through that for all of heaven. But that's because... Their idea of God is boring. Well, my God is not boring. I mean, think about this for a second. Who invented laughter? God did. I mean, who invented things like, well, how about taste buds? I mean, you got taste buds. You live in a cursed world, and food is still too darn good. Okay? If that's true, if that's true, Can you imagine what the food tastes like there? When you can eat it all, all you want, and it's no worries. You see, that's who your God is. It was God that invented adrenaline so that you could have fun on a roller coaster. I mean, that and getting chased by bears. But between the two things, I mean, you know, know, adrenaline. God invented that idea. God invented nerves so that you could taste the fruit. So that you could hear the wind in the trees. So that your eyes could see the beauty of the sunrise and the sunset that he made. So that you could taste the salt from the sea on your tongue. God gave you these things in a cursed world. And he said, I'm going to make it all new. And this is going to look boring when you get there. That's the heaven that I have created for you. It was God that invented fun. Do you think it was humans that came up with this idea? I mean, this this really frustrates me because the devil's done a good job at lying to us, saying that sin is what's fun. That's why we call Vegas Sin City. Okay, I've got news for you. That ain't true. I mean, when people say, you know, it's sinful, chocolate cake is sinful. No, it's not. God invented chocolate. God invented sugar. God invented my taste buds. It was me and human beings that invented gluttony and made it a problem. Right? 
And I mean, people, they say, well, I don't, I don't want to go to heaven because, you know, after all, up there, you know, there's going to be no sex, right? And that's the ultimate in human fun. Hold on a second. Who invented that? It was God that invented this. We forget that part. God invented men and women, and they was naked as jaybirds. And they were having a really good time. And if it makes you blush, good. Because God invented this. It is we that invented fornication and adultery and homosexuality. It is we that took what God made and twisted it into something that he did not intend. And you know what the truth is? Anybody who's walked down the path of stupidity in this world when it comes to sex knows that there is no fulfillment there. There's nothing but a chain wrapped around your neck. All it does is steal from you. But when you do things God's way, oh my goodness sakes alive. Well, we'll just leave that there. It was God that invented blushing. But you know what God also invented? He has an amazing sense of humor. I mean, God was the one that invented this. That is a platypus. It is the world's weirdest creature. I mean, it was like God was, I don't know what he was thinking, but he's going, I'm going to invent something that is just so weird that anybody's going to look at it's going to laugh. Because I'm going to take a duck and a beaver and go, poof. And then it's a mammal, but it lays eggs. And they're eggs like a turtle. And it comes back, and it still nurses. And by the way, it has poisonous fangs on its back feet. And you know why I'm going to invent it? So that every evolutionist in the world I can laugh at. Because there's not a chance you're going to explain that one. God has a sense of humor. I mean, it's God that invented this. I mean, come on. I have poor lemurs looking at the camera going, what? It's my hair, man. You know? God invented this. God has a sense of humor. It is God that makes us smile, makes us laugh. Flowers are beautiful because he is beautiful. That's why. See, kittens are cute because God wants you to go, oh, how sweet. Because God is the ultimate in sweetness. That's why he invented kittens. It is God that invented the worlds and said, I will spread a universe out across the sky. And you won't even be able to count the stars. And every single one of them is different. And I'm going to let you go look at them. I'm going to let you go explore. I'm going to give you a body that can fly and can move at the speed of thought. And you're going to be able to go to worlds out there and see what I have made. And bring the report back to the throne room where we will worship because you made this. Heaven is not boring. In fact... I like this quote from Randy Alcorn. It says, the day that I die will be the best day that I've ever lived. It's the truth. That's what heaven is. And you know, he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again. I'm going to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Tom speaks right up and says, well, wait a second. Lord, we don't know where you're going. And, and we don't know the way. And what does Jesus say? I'm the way. I am the way. What's the context? The context is heaven. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the truth about it. I'm the life that you're looking for. No one's going to get there except through me. That's it. Why do you think we named this church John 14, 6? Because it's the hope of an eternal reward that we need to keep our eyes on. Jesus is the way. Now, some people want to get all upset about that and say, oh, you're being arrogant saying that Jesus is the only way. Look, if Jesus was a man-made idea, then that would be an arrogant thing to say that he's the only way. But he's not a man-made way. He's God's way. It's not us reaching up to him. It's God reaching down to us. So that's not arrogant. 
That's like understanding that when the house is on fire, do you see the fire escape? It's the only way out. That's not arrogant. That's just the truth. And if you don't get on the fire escape, you will die. So if the house is on fire and I'm shouting, go down the fire escape, and everybody's going, you're being arrogant. Bye. <laughs> you know, you don't want to listen, man. But I'm going to keep shouting until I, I have no choice but to get on the fire escape and get out, okay? And that's what you and I need to do. Now, some of you are, are looking at me. God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And some of you are looking at me going, I already knew that. You're already a Christian. So how in the world can you apply this, this teaching about heaven and hell, when you're already a Christian? What do you do with this? How do you apply this? Take out your communication slips that say connect. Put your name on it and flip it over because I can't pray for you if I don't know what your name is. And you're going to see some choices back there. Look, here's how you can apply this. Listen to me now. I wanted to stoke your hopes for heaven. I wanted to give you the same thing that Jesus gave his disciples, which is this is where you're going. You need to focus in on it. You know why we need to focus in on it? Because heaven is for real. So if you're a Christian today, listen to me. This life is as close to hell as you will ever get. Somebody say amen to that. This life is as close to hell as you are ever going to get. And I want you to think about that. When hard times come your way, I want you to go, wow, this is the worst it's ever going to get for me. Because I'm going to heaven. And you need to get fired up about this. There are too many people that call themselves Christians and they walk around looking like they've been sucking on a green lemon for two weeks. I'm a Christian. Praise the Lord. Okay, come on. You're going to heaven. Why is it that we're going to heaven and we start playing a worship song like, oh, happy day, and everybody's going, look, you are going to heaven. This is the worst it's ever going to get for you. You see, C.S. Lewis said, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this one. If you've got your eyes on heaven, if you've got your eyes on a place where it is a story that you read, where every page is better than the one before, and that's what you are looking forward to, it should give you a hope and a drive, especially when things are hard. But we get our eyes off the prize. Paul said, keep your eyes on the prize. Run as if you're going to win the race because you will win. You see, but we get our eyes off of it. So the first thing you could check is you could go, I'm going to thank God today that heaven is his promise and I'm going there. We need to get a little bit more fired up around here. We need to clap a little louder. We need to say amen a few more times. We need to get a little happier about the fact that we're going to heaven. And people who are new, who are not believers, need to walk in here and go, this is the happiest place on earth, and there's nobody with ears around here. This is it. <laughs> but instead, we're like, boy, I've had a hard week. No, you haven't. That's hell. You're going to heaven. That's nothing compared to where you're going. There's a second group. If you're a Christian today, and you know that this life is as close to heaven as unbelievers will ever get. Then what are you going to do about that? Oh, wait a minute. I just flipped it on you, didn't I? You see, we forget that part. If this is as close to hell as I'm going to ever get, then this is as close to heaven as a lot of people are going to get. So what should I do? I should ask God to help me to share that good news with everyone I can, every chance that I can, Everywhere, at any time. And if you find yourself the kind of person that's just too afraid, drag them to church. I'll do it for you. I will tell them. Bring them here. Bribe them here. I mean, think about this for a second. I mean, when the rapture comes and the, the trumpet sounds, you know what I want to do? 
I want to grab two sinners under each arm on my way up. And I'm going to say, look, I'm going to drop you right now unless you give your heart to Jesus. I mean, look, we've got to be totally sold out all the time because we're going to heaven. And they aren't. We need to drag people in here. And if that means I got to bribe them with lunch to get them here, then that's what I got to do. And if we have to come up with yet another outreach to try and get them to come in here, then that's what we will do. Because some people, I don't understand why you're doing all this VBS stuff and all this harvest. That sure seems like a waste of money. If one soul comes to heaven with us because of it, it is worth every penny, every hour, everything we have done. We need to be relentless because we're going to heaven and they aren't. Heaven's real. So if this morning you are not sure that if you died today, you would go there, you can be sure right now. Let's pray.